I think because it's October 7th, we should just take a moment to say a Misha Beirach if everyone's amenable. Misha Beirach Avotenu Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, Yivarech et Chayalei Tzva Hagana Yisrael Va'anchai HaBitachon, Ha'umdim Al Mishmar Atzenu Va'arei Eloheinu, Mi'gvul Ha'levanon Ad Medvar Mitzrayim, Mayam Hagadol Ad Lavo Ha'arava, B'chom Ha'kom Shehem, V'yabasha Ba'avir Uvayam, Amen. Inu Shabbat Shemayim Sif Shalom Ba'aretz V'Semchat Olam Lecha Yoshveha V'Shav Yaakov V'Shaked V'Sha'anan V'Ein Machred V'Kiyam Bahem V'Kuyam Banu B'Mheir B'Yamenu M'Kra Shekasuv B'Micha V'Yashvu Ish Tachat Gafno V'Tachat E'Na To V'Ein Machred K'Fi Adonai Tzvaot Diber U'Feroz Sukat Shlomecha Al-Kol Yoshvei Sevel Atzacha V'Chein Yihi Ratzom V'Nomar Amen Amen <clears throat> this week in my newsletter, I wrote about the question, here we're on the eve of Yom Kippur, and we say before Kol Nidre, V'yeshiva Shemala, V'yeshiva Shemata, Anu Amit Kavnin Lehit Palel Em Ha'avaryanim, that above and below, we, we are matirin, we're given permission to daven with avar yonim. Avar yonim are people who commit ave, or two things, either people who commit averot, avar yonim, or historically, this um, tefillah <clears throat> was written because in the places where they forced Jews to convert to Judy, to um, Islam or to Christianity, they were outwardly Christians and Muslims, but in their hearts, they always had the Pintalayid. And so when they came, it came to Yom Kippur, they'd hide, they'd, they'd, they'd quietly go into the shuls. And although they might be looking like Christians and Muslims, they would ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for forgiveness for having con converted to Islam or to Christianity. And so in general, we don't, Davin with those who are Christians and Muslims as interfaith. But because <laughs> we understood that they did this out of force, we Hashem gave us the ability to Davin with these Avaryanim, with those who allegedly uh, converted to other religions. And this in today's, and it's so ironic, everything, wow. nothing is happenstance, that today we're talking about the concept of Theodicy. Ra why Rasha Vitovlo Vitsadik Viralo? Why is it that uh, some that the evil prosper and the righteous suffer? And I just it's actually kind of like a culmination of what we're talking about. When something happens to us, is it bad or is it good? It seems to us like bad, but if we have bitachon, sometimes if we're lucky enough, HaKadosh Baruch Hu lets us see how what seems to be bad is good. For instance, Shandy missing her plane to um, <clears throat> from Greece. She had a little vacation. Exactly a year ago this week, I had the flood in my basement. Or last week, I had the flood in my basement into, into a rental income company eight months later. So we have bitachon that what Hashem gives us is for the good. So this is an extension. We say, why is it that a, a Russia, a bad, per, what we, okay, well, Russia <clears throat> prospers and a righteous person suffers. And I'm going, before I get into the text itself, I think logically we need to understand, we need to take a serious break and say, who are we to judge who is righteous and who is evil? So when we, when we want to say, why does this righteous person suffer? A, 
we have to say, is that per person righteous? Only HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows. B, <laughs> is this person suffering or is he given um, tests in which he will succeed and be able to get more rewards in this world and the work to come? When someone seems evil, is he evil? We look at him and we think he's, we, he's evil, but is he evil? And is he really prospering? Will he take that money and end up in jail with it? So is it really a sachar, a reward for it? Or is it really just another test from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to say, hey, you have a chance now to change from your evil ways and give tzedakah, or you can continue your evil ways. If he decides to change and give some of it, even a penny, to tzedakah, then really what when we say that something is prosper, someone prospered, it may not even be for himself. It could be truly that that person is evil, but that his son, who's going to inherit, who's going to be good, will, will be able to take that money and do good things for B'nai Yisrael. We see that also with Esther HaMalka. Esther is either a daughter of were married to Mordechai. Horrendous that she is taken as 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 uh, kidnapped and taken as a wife to Ahasuerus. No one would say that's good. That has to be evil. And if you died early on, you would have died thinking, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu, really? It wasn't enough that you took away her parents from Esther. You had to give her to a drunken Persian king." But then we realized it was her child with Ahasuerus, Koresh, that allowed B'nai Yisrael to return to Eretz Yisrael. So we could say, oh, we have that right, B'derech HaTeva, to say, oh my goodness, look what happened to Esther. She gets taken by this drunken king. You have to have Bitachon. And it was so that she could have a child who would give permission to the Jews to rebuild the base Hamikdash, to build the base Hamikdash Hasheni, the second one. With all of that in mind, and keeping in mind that we're supposed to be davening with the Avaryanim, who are these Avaryanim? And the answer is we are all Avaryanim. We all sin. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, we learn in this week's Parsha, Hashem says to him again, because you hit the rock and you didn't speak to it, you can't come into Eretz Yisrael. You're going to die. You won't be able. If Moshe could sin, he who spoke with HaKadosh Baruch Hu almost face to face, if he could sin, we're all sinning. And not only is it that we sin, but in our Yom Kippur Tefillot, we talk about the 10 martyrs, the 10 great tzaddikim who were, mar who were tortured before they were killed. And a question is, again, if these people dedicated their lives, why did they sin? Well, one, the common idea is because he, they had to be punished for the 10 tribes who wanted to kill Yosef HaTzadik. But B'derech HaTeva, others will say, other commentaries, commentators say that they died because there was so much sin going on, disrespect between people, that the base of Niktosh had to be destroyed. These 10 martyrs lived right before the destruction, and they should have found a way to have calmed down tensions between the people and to bring shalom. Instead of looking in their sparim and and enhancing their own learning and amongst themselves, they should have reached out to the common Jew, to the Jews who were hurting each other and found a way, find a way to unite them. So with all of this as an introduction to what the Shar Habitachon has to say and going into Yom Kippur, where we have an opportunity in the coming holidays to invite a neighbor who is to invite an elderly person, a divorced person, a widowed person into our homes for Yantif so they're not alone. This is our opportunity to bring people close and, and, and bring shalom so that together as a nation, we can bring Geula. Here we go. Um, 
The question is, why does a righteous man suffer? According to the Shar HaBitachon, number one, perhaps the righteous man wasn't always righteous and he needed to be punished for his prior behavior. Two, those who suffer in this world for their sins receive greater rewards in the world to come. Three, sometimes a well-known community person suffers, so his actions are scrutinized by those around him who can learn how to accept God's suffering with love, to sanctify God's name as Eo, the biblical fi figure Job did. Number four, some righteous suffer for the sins of their generation. Again, so those around him learn how to accept pain and suffering. Five, there are righteous who suffer because they are not zealous for the sake of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in ensuring that those around them know they are sinning and attempt to dissuade them from sinning. As we know, as an aside, we know that the verse, Hocheach tochiach es amisecha, that you should give musr to, you should say to somebody, perhaps you can do things this way so that you don't sin is connected to the because if you love the people around you, you don't want them to sin, not for their own soul and not because those in Klal Yisrael are affected by it as well. And this can be members of his family or his community. So that's what we talked about, the Asara Haruge Machot, the 10 martyrs may not just not have been as active as they could to bring love to those who were off the derech and bring them in to the fold. Reasons why the wicked prosper. One, God rewards the wicked for the good they did in the past to destroy them in the world to come. Very powerful. Two, to test the person for his devotion and faith and trust in God. Three, to inform the person that God finds disfavor in him and he better repent his ways. Four, the goodness in a perceived wicked person can be a deposit for him to bequeath to a deserving heir. Five, mm -hmm. what we perceive as good could ultimately be the wicked person's downfall. As it is written in Kohelet, ver chapter five, verse 12, Osher shamor leve'alav, lera'ato, riches kept by their owner for his harm. So in other words, he could take that money and blow it and be poor. He could take that money and use it for criminal activity. He'll end up in jail, lera'ato. Six, perhaps the wealth is a deposit for a wicked man who repents at a later time, like King Benasha. Number seven, if a wicked person had a righteous parent, perhaps he is benefiting in the merit of that parent. Eight, the wicked prosper to tempt those who were hidden, who were hidden wicked people to out themselves so all know their true nature. So if you think someone is a chassid and he's given money and suddenly he ends up in jail because he committed crimes, it's so that you know, the people around him know that he should not be trusted even though he wants to make you think that he is righteous. In sum, we should neither be jealous of those who prosper nor lose faith when we see those who are righteous suffer. For Hashem keeps a true tab of who is righteous and who is evil and what they deserve in this world versus what they will receive in the world to come. Our challenge is to believe, indeed know, for a certainty that all that happens in the world is controlled by God, who is omniscient, who knows everything, who is omnipotent, can do anything, and that all is for the good. Shady, you're on. Amazing, yes. Suri. Thank you, Suri. That's wonderful. So now we are going to our Shar Habitacha, <laughs> and we're up to a part that says, one who relies on Hashem profits in the world and the world to come. The Beis HaLevi briefly states that some of the benefits of relying on Hashem, one who relies on Hashem will gain in this world and he will certainly obtain whatever he needs he is lacking. 
Hashem will not bring hunger upon the soul of righteous. And it is written, evil tidings, he will have no fear. His heart is firm, confident in Hashem. And now I'm going to go that aside from the eternal reward, one receives for his bitachon in the world to come. There are many benefits to be tachon even in this world. Indeed, the Gemara in Menachah states that one who relies on Hashem will receive a protection from him in this world and in the world to come. This implies that Hashem is certainly giving the person who relies on him what he needs. And for further discussion, we will see an overview. So I was looking at different parts and I picked a part that I liked with the best insurance. Reb Moshe Malka compared one with true bitachon to one who has good car insurance. Imagine a man who one morning discovers that his car was stolen. If he has good insurance, he remains calm for he knows that he will be fully compensated for his loss and will shortly be driving a brand new car. So too, one has bitachon has the best insurance possibly possible the policy possible. He always is calm and relaxed, knowing that Hashem will care for him. I'm going to stop here for a moment because, you know, we it's now coming to Yom Kippur and we just had Rosh Hashanah and we always have to look at our year of what we went through, good, bad, or indifferent. And at the, sometimes when things happen to us, we don't really realize that it's really for the benefit. And I'm looking about car insurance. And on Zos Hanukkah, when the war broke out last year in October, a year ago, um, I started to him in my home every single day, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And it was a thir- it was a Thursday afternoon when we were saying to him. And then I got a call from my special needs client to pick her up. And I ran out, and this one girl came in back of me. And I went in my car and I stopped at my stop sign. And boom, on Zos Hanukkah, I had a car accident. And I walked out of my car and I said, thank you, Hashem, that Tehillim saved me. That was how I truly believed. That was my bitachon. At the end of the day, um, I didn't know that I had a case and I didn't know. At the bottom line is, Hashem at the end, he gave me this car accident because he wanted to give me a gift. And how did he give me this gift? By someone telling me, you have a case, they passed the stop sign, they rammed into you. And at the end of the day, Hashem gave me a nishika. He gave me a kiss. That's because I didn't complain. I didn't say, oh, my car, yeah, my car was total. But Baruch Hashem, I said, oh, thank you, Hashem, for saving me because of all the Salem that I said. I truly believe that that was a gift from Hashem. But you see, if people are different and don't have the tachon and don't see all the gifts that we get, at the time you say, that's a horrible thing that happened to me and I have to go to doctors and I have to go to PT and blah, 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 blah. But thank you, Hashem, you saved me. And at the end of the day, he even gave me a couple of dollars extra. So he always is, when, when one is calm and relaxed, knowing that Hashem will care for him, that's an ultimate of the Tacho. And, and that was one of another thing that happened to me this year. And I really, truly believe that when things do happen, we all have to say, thank you, Hashem. Sing, sing on Ms. Marla Soda. When I was stuck in Athens and my son, Benny, was, Ma, sing your Ms. Marla Soda. Ma. <laughs> and I did. And I was singing it because it helped me have the bitachon deep. You know, we're all human beings. And yes, I was a little scared, should I say? Athens is not the most Jewish place to be stuck in in the airport. They didn't have a piece of fruit to even buy for kosher. And I truly believe that Hashem was testing me on the kosher situation because when I switched my flight to Delta to go the next morning, I wasn't used to making flights and I didn't even have a kosher meal. So I didn't eat for 48 hours. But then when I came home and I went on the scale and I lost four pounds, I also said, thank you, Hashem, because that was the way, you know what? I drank my water. I had my coffee. I had Powerade. I bought, I had two bananas. The stewardess found me and this kosher bar and I had my own. But at the end of the day, 
I had Pitachon that I wasn't going to die from, from th hunger. I wasn't going to die from being stranded. Hashem really, 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 really took care of me. And I did sing Ms. Marla Soda. So, of course, Bitochon is not a substitute for buying an insurance policy. One must always do the proper Hishtadlus and then rely on Hashem to provide his needs. Um, but rather strengthen himself in his reliance on Hashem with regard to everything that arose from him during the lifetime. So you can't get Bitochon in a second. It's kind of a... Constant growing, 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 just like you want to lose weight, you want to dive in with Kavana. This is the time of year. Which Mida do we work on? Well, I say work on, okay, Torah, Tefillah, and Avoda. Our Avoda is Torah and Tefillah. When you have Torah in your life, you'll have Bitachon. And when you have Tefillah in your life, you know that there's a higher upper God. So my friend Sharon couldn't wait to give me on Rosh Hashanah. She was learning the Shema Yisroel in depth. And she gave it to me. She came knocking at my door and I fell out. And my mother said she's not really up and available. So she came in shul and she brought it to me. And I want to read that when you say your Shema Yisroel during this time of year, during a Therese Shuva, Hashem the King it's Melech Neman. You're fulfilling the, the mitzvah of Kriya Shema, and you're accepting upon yourself all machut shamayim, that Hashem, mm -hmm. the king who is trustworthy to reward and punish fearly. Shema Yisrael, I, as a member of Kali Yisrael, should hear and concentrate and accept Hashem, the ruler. Hashem is the ruler of the world, who was, is, and will always be. Elokeinu is our powerful Hashem. Hashem is the ruler of the world, who was, is, and will always be. Echad is one. Ein od novado. Over the earth and seven heavens. Over the four directions. And then when we say, Baruch Shem Kivod Machusoli Lam Ve'ed in quiet, may May Kavod Shamayim increasingly expand until everyone recognizes the existence of Hashem. I am then when you're saying the Ahavta, you're fulfilling the mitzvah of Ahavas Hashem. When you love Hashem and you truly say this in Yitzila during Shema, that's how you will truly have the Tachon. Ahavta es Hashem Lokecha, and you shall fulfill his commandments with love, Hashem, who deals with the Bamidas Harachamim. Or even when he deals with the Midas Adin, the whole Levavacha, with the, your whole heart, the Yetzer Tov and the Yetzer Hara, the whole Nashacha, and with your whole soul, emotions, and desires, the whole Meodecha, and with all that Hashem has given you, the ode of talents, abilities, and resources. Suri, you have talents and abilities to get on Zoom and do these wonderful Shah Habitachon podcasts and things. We have to take our talents and our all the homo decha that you had brima ela, and these words shall be that I command you personally. Hayom today, every day, a new olive of ha upon your heart. You are the charge. You are in charge of your emotion. This is nonten, and you should constantly repeat and study them until they become part of you. Levanecha, only then can your children, students absorb from you. That's the only way that we could be teachers. If we truly believe, Levancha, only then can your children and students. The Dibar Taban and speak of these words of Torah, Bishop, um, whether you are in the privacy of your home or when you are on the road among the people. Bishop Cha, Reaffirm them at the end of each day, Uvakumach, and again as a pre preparation to begin the new day. Ukashatam laos ayadecha, vahayula totafos bene nechem, ukatam al mitzos beitecha, uvisharecha. Reaffirm them at the end of each day, and again as preparation to begin the new day. And bind these words on your arm opposite your heart to control your toeva and your thoughts, and let them be crown between your eyes to sub subjugate your senses to do all what he, Hashem wants and write them on the doorposts of your homes and gates to remind you that nothing is permanent except for the knowledge of Hashem. 
We are supposed to dive in with Kavana. We are supposed to talk to Hashem like I'm talking to you. And that will help with our bitachon throughout the coming year. So now I want to so thank you to the daily bitachon that enjoy your assets with bitachon. We are on chapter 16, page 69, I believe. And in our last that lesson we learned that having wealth is no guarantee of keeping it. Now the Chovos Halavovos takes the concepts one step further, telling that us if a person does not rely on God for his wealth, even if he is able to keep it, God may prevent him from enjoying it. Talking about wealth. So when I was stuck in Athens, I didn't have any euros or francs. And I didn't know how I was going to get in the car. You know, I didn't know. I said, do you take credit card? Do you take American cash? And he said, yeah, we take credit card in American. I said, okay, I have $35 in American. Okay, that's great. I actually had $35. I said, that will take me to the hotel and it'll take me back. And he said, yes, because I called this guy to pick me back up to go in the morning because I, I really, really trusted him. Hashem gave me him. And he was really very nice to me. So we illustrate the point that we can observe many arrogant people in this world. And there were plenty of people that weren't so friendly and so nice and kind. But he was a 40-year-old guy that really took me sightseeing and then a scenic route to the, to the hotel. And then he took me the other way back to the airport in the morning. So I wasn't nervous. He said, I'll give you my number. What's that me? And, you know, what's that me? And tell me and remind me 9 o'clock in the morning. So the thing is, we can observe many arrogant people who seem to have wealth and yet appear totally lack of bitachon. But the Chavos HaLavavos teaches us that although they may have money and we have no idea whether they're actually enjoying it, a man may be with, able to afford to eat in the fa fanciest restaurant, but then he might suffer from indigestion. One person can experience complete enjoyment eating a simple roll, while another gets sick from the most exotic fruit. We can't gauge the actual enjoyment each person experiences. I was just happy to have my water and my Powerade. Then the Ben Ishchai tells the following story, which occurred in Baghdad many years ago. There was a very wealthy, yet very frugal and miserly, miserly man who would never spend money even on himself. His worker felt sorry for his boss, who had so much money but never seemed to enjoy it. Baklava was the boss's favorite pastry, but he was so miserably to buy it for himself because it was expensive. So the worker had an idea. He went out for a coffee with his boss. The worker took some company money and offered to buy the boss baklava. The boss was happy to eat what he bought, was a free treat, and took a bite. Suddenly, he started to choke, and he couldn't swallow the bite or dislodge it. Although he didn't realize that it was his money that purchased the pastry, Hashem denied him pleasure for his wealth. The worker quickly told the rabbi who was present that the boss's money had paid for the baklava. The rabbi gave the worker the price of pastry. Now I'm the one who paid for it, he explained. Instantly, the boss was able to swallow. The then Ishai explains that this man was truly exemplifying that what is written in the Chovos Halavovos. Even though he was wealthy, he was subject to the faith described in Kohelet. Hashem did not give him the power to enjoy it because he lacked bitachon. He could not enjoy his own money or the pastry if, if he paid for. Once the rabbi paid for it, it was no longer the product of his own wealth, and therefore he was able to swallow. And so the Chavos HaLavavos tells us, we can't judge whether people are enjoying their assets. And if we want to enjoy our money, the secret is rely on Hashem. The practical takeaway is ask yourself whether your wealth brings you greater worries or greater happiness. If the answer is worries, give some serious thought to where you place Hashem in your vision of your Parnassah. So there was this concierge that let me come. It was a hotel, of course, a sheet from the airport and he let me come and sit and he saw I was like a little you know parched and I was like over like in a bad mood and then, and I didn't have any any chart I had maybe like a little bit of juice left in my phone and he let me plug it in 
And he said, just relax. And I was sitting and drinking my water, my water and my, the Powerade was like my gold. And I said, thank you, Hashem. And he found me this cab driver and I gave him 20 bucks. I'm never going to see that guy again. I didn't have to give him anything, but I knew if I give him the 20 bucks and say, thank you for taking care of me, Hashem is going to take care of me because we have to be our own. You know, if he knew I was Jewish or not, it didn't really matter. But at the end of the day, we have to go out of our way to do a, um, you know, a Kiddush Hashem and to say thank you to Hashem and go to the full utmost, you know, of Bitachon. And with that, I want to wish everyone a Hagefen, Hatzlacher, and Gazunt, and Parnasatova, and Nachis, mm-hmm. and all is good, and you should be a Gamarto, mm-hmm. and you should be sealed with good, and we should have this war over, and we should be. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sandy. That's so Same beautiful. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. 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 and you. Thank 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 you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For my refua and for Rami, I, I just can't thank you enough. And I thank all the women that tune in every week to log on, to spend the time. It's not an easy thing. And I love you all. And I wish everybody a Gamach Sima Tova. Amen. A year. Thank you too. Amen. You too, Marsha. Marsha, have a good Gizund Gebenstior. We should, we should not, we very, very quickly, we should not have, we should continue doing this year. But as the thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for your complete Amen. wish and lema. And that's what we daven for every day. And that's what Amen. I daven for as they blow shofar. And we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to do this. Message. And I truly believe that Hashem is listening to all your davening. And that's why he keeps me going from day to day. Uh, Baruch Hashem. I'm grateful Amen. for it. Because every day is a miracle. Amen. Oh, I, that's it's true. true. Have a good Zoom. Good bench to everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you, Sarah. Thank Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank Thank you, guys. Bye, Marsha. Bye. Bye, 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 Bye,